welcome to Dapper Drams, where we taste and review whiskey to try to determine if the dram in our glass is indeed a Dapper Dram. You know, whiskey tasting parties can be a great way to introduce your friends and family to the wonderful world of whiskey. Or they can serve as an excuse to get together with other whiskey enthusiasts to try new bottles and uh, just generally socialize with people who enjoy what you enjoy. This weekend, I hosted my first whiskey tasting party. And I learned some things along the way about what worked and maybe some things that I could have gone without. Today on Dapper Drams, I'm going to give you my tips for hosting a successful whiskey tasting party. I knew that my tasting party needed to focus around what I loved, Scotch whiskey. I figured it'd be a great way to introduce my friends and family to my passion. This brings me to my first tip, tip number one figure out what type of tasting party you want to have. What theme do you want to follow? Do you want whiskeys all from one country, all from one region, all one style? Something you need to think about. I knew right away what I wanted to do, which was one single malt from each whiskey producing region in Scotland. So I sent out a text to a few friends just to gauge interest. When all of them responded, yes, they were interested, I figured now it's time to invite more people. So tip number two, when deciding who to invite, first, you need to determine how many people you can actually accommodate. Now, I sent out a total of about 15 invitations, not including myself. And honestly, I expected about maybe six or seven people to respond yes. I invited the others simply out of a courtesy. They're my friends. Why not invite them? But when 11 people RSVP'd and said, yes, we're coming, I kind of started to panic. You see, my house is not really set up for an event like that with that many people all gathered in one small area. I needed something else. I knew that I needed a new location, which brings me back to tip number two, and we'll call this tip number 2A, have a backup location. I was lucky enough that my wife's parents said that we could use their house to host the whiskey party. Uh, their house is a little bit bigger than ours, and it's laid out in a way that is really more suited for an event like this or any party gathering whatever it's it was just better so they said yes so great we've got our location so i've got my guest list i have my location and i have my theme where do i go next tip number three your bottle selection as most of the people coming to the party were newcomers to scotch and whiskey in general i wanted to make sure that i was offering them bottles that were good representations of each region of scotland also, that the bottles were approachable, nothing too overpowering. I didn't want to have to worry about burning off anyone's tongues or singeing their nose hairs. This right away ruled out anything that was cask strength. Too much of that, and they're not going to be able to taste much the rest of the night. It's just going to feel like burning to anyone who isn't used to something like that. I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't giving them too many bottles that were of the same style. Having three sherry bombs, two heavily peated whiskeys, and one that was from a first fill bourbon barrel, it doesn't really offer a whole lot of diversity. So it's important to take that into consideration. In the end, I ended up going with the Auchentoshan American Oak. Uh, what else did I do? I did the Delwini, 15 year old, the Highland Park, 12 year old, uh, the Springbank 10-year-old, the McAllen 12-year-old uh, double cask, which I don't have, and I'll get to that later, and lastly, the Ardbeg Kelpie, in this order. The bottle order can be called tip 3A. Knowing which order to serve each bottle is important. Obviously, you don't want to start the night with something that's heavily peated like the Kelpie because that will end up being all that they're tasting the rest of the night. You can't really get rid of those heavily peated flavors regardless of palate cleansers or additional whiskeys, it's always just going to hang around a little bit. So you really need to be aware of which whiskeys are going to offer lighter flavors and then move into the heavier flavors later on in the night. So now we have our bottle selection and we know what order we are going to serve them in. So where do we go from here? Well, a tasting party is all about tasting whiskey, but it's also about figuring out which ones you like over the others. The best way to do this is with scorecards. Tip four, find a scorecard that works best for your situation. 
Now, I couldn't find one in particular that I liked that had everything uh, on it that I wanted. So what I did was I jumped online and I found a few that I liked elements of each one, but maybe not one as a whole. So I took little bits of each one and I made my own. This is an example right here. It didn't take long. It wasn't hard. I used Microsoft Paint and Microsoft Word. Honestly, it wasn't all that difficult and it ended up working out just fine. Now, if your guests are new to whiskey, as were mine, they may have a hard time articulating what it is that they were picking up on the nose and palate. What you need to do is guide them along. Um, and the best way to do that uh, that I found was using a flavor wheel. I used this one in particular. Tip number five, use a flavor wheel. I printed out enough for everyone to have, and they were constantly looking at it all night long just checking each one. Does it taste like this? Does it smell like that? It worked out really well. And honestly, even seasoned whiskey drinkers should have, at least have one available to look at. It's, it's a great source of material. So now it's the day of the party and everyone shows up and you hand them their scorecards and their flavor wheels and their glass and you pour the whiskey and you tell them to write down everything that they're smelling and tasting and that's all there is to it, right? Well, not even close. If you're dealing with only seasoned whiskey drinkers and experts, yeah, maybe that's the case. But if you're dealing with the majority of people in your life, most of them will have no whiskey knowledge at all. Never tried it, don't like it, don't care for it, but they're interested in learning, so that's why they're here. It's your responsibility to educate them, not only on how to properly nose and taste a whiskey, but also just about whiskey facts in general. Tip number six, you are their teacher have a lesson plan. It's up to you to figure out what you want to present. Now, when it came to the way I wanted to go about it, I pretty much wanted to throw out every little bit of whiskey knowledge that I had. Maybe it was a good idea, maybe it wasn't, but that's what I wanted to do. I started furiously writing down every little bit of whiskey knowledge that I had. It took me quite a, quite a number of days, a number of revisions to get down what I wanted, but I went through everything, I checked my facts, I double checked my facts, I didn't want to be giving out information that was false, misleading, um, or just contradictory to, you know, I say one thing here, I say another thing here, they don't really add up. You got to make sure that everything you are saying makes sense to them and it doesn't contradict what you've already said. So now you've written down everything that you want to present. Now it's time to figure out how to present it to them. If I threw out all of the information that I had on the history, science, variations, etc., all things whiskey, right away, before I even poured the first bottle, I will have spent way too much time talking, and I would have nothing to talk about between bottles, between tastings, later on in the night. Tip 6A. Make sure your lesson plan or your presentation has a flow that makes sense. It wouldn't make sense to talk about peat phenol levels and first fill versus refill casks before you even explain what whiskey is made of. So you want to order everything so that it all makes sense. I started out by explaining what Scotch whiskey actually was, the different regulations that went into play with it, what its components are. And then I went into the different categories of Scotch, you know, uh, single malt, single grain, blended, etc. I went into the different regions of Scotland, the traditional flavors associated with them. Then I went into proper nosing techniques. After that, we got to the first bottle. I saved some useful information for later on down the road. Now, tip number seven, back to the scorecards. You have to explain to them how the scorecards work and what they are expected to write down. Not everybody knows what they're expected to write down on these cards. It's new to them. It's a quick and easy tip, or it's a quick and easy step, but it's a very important one nonetheless. So you've poured the first whiskey, you've explained how to properly nose and taste it, they have their flavor wheel, they have their scorecards, so they're good to go, right? Well, not really. Newcomers most likely will have a very difficult time articulating what they're experiencing. They just don't have the educated palate that you and I do. This leads me to tip number eight guide and encourage them. It can be frustrating if one guest is picking up things that the others aren't. It's important to explain to them that just because the guy sitting next to you is getting raspberries and you're not, it doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. It doesn't mean that 
they're doing something and you just don't have the technique down. No two people will experience a whiskey the same way. It's it's all very subjective and you have to explain that to them. If you have already tried the whiskey that they are tasting, it might help to throw out a few tasting notes that you got the last time that you uh, tasted it. I found that this had a particularly profound effect. Um, I would throw out a few notes and people immediately would start saying, oh yes, now that you say it, I get it, or I was just about to say that. And it really helped to reinforce uh, what they were already tasting and helped them to make connections. It, it really just let them know that, hey, I'm doing this right. If I, could, if I got the same notes that the expert got, then hey, I, I know what I'm doing now. Now, while they're busy with their current whiskey, nosing and tasting it, don't just sit back and become a non-factor. Tip number nine, keep them engaged. Even though most of their attention is going to be focused on the whiskey at hand, uh, it's a good idea to keep the presentation going. Keep presenting different facts. Make it relevant to what they are tasting. If it's information about the distillery, about the bottle, about the region itself, throw it out there. They may, they may miss things because they're busy doing what they're doing, but some people may be listening and they might gain some useful knowledge. It's also a good idea to encourage them to ask questions. Um, if you don't know the answer offhand, look it up. It really helps to keep them engaged. It makes them realize that you're not just throwing a bunch of stuff at them. You want to interact with them. One way to help keep them engaged is by the use of visual aids, which is tip 9A. Use visuals. I had uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I was projecting on a screen with all kinds of different uh, slides with mostly just pictures. Um, informative pictures, uh, a few maps, um, a few joke slides keep things light and fun. And I also had a physical copy of a distillery map of Scotland, which I referenced several times throughout the night. If you're just standing there uh, talking, throwing out facts, it can get a little stale and the use of visual aids can help to keep things fresh. So that's the meat and potatoes on hosting a tasting party. But there's a few other factors that you need to consider. Tip number 10, be a mindful host. It's very important to do the little things, like making sure there's always water on the table for those to stay hydrated and rinse their mouths out between whiskeys. Having light snacks laid out like trail mix or crackers or pretzels or anything that is going to be easy on the palate and not overly saturate their, their mouths with odd flavors that will interfere with what they're tasting. It's also very important to have a system in place for cleaning the glasses. Now, six bottles and 12 people uh, was not very financially feasible for me to purchase 72 Glencairn glasses. Instead, I got 24 glasses and had someone help me out every other round to clean them. It's important to figure out this system before you start the night so you're not scrambling to run off and clean glasses in the middle of your presentation. I did ask for a small donation to help pay for the glasses, and at the end of the night, everyone got to take home their own glass. It was a very nice way to offer a memento uh, for the night, and it may encourage them to go out, buy their own bottle, use the glass to do their own nosing and tasting, and it might help them get into whiskey. This brings me back to the reason I don't have the bottle of the Macallan on here. Um, as a special treat for the guests, I wrote everyone's name down on a piece of paper, threw them in a hat, picked the name out of the hat, and the winner got to take home the bottle of their choice. The winner took home the Macallan. Obviously, you don't have to do this. It was just something that I wanted to do to thank everyone for coming out, just, an offer, just offer a special little treat. Um, now, if you get someone who really didn't enjoy anything during the night, you can say, hey, I get it. You don't want any of these whiskeys. Pick someone else's name. I'm sure they won't mind. To go along with tip 10, it's also a good idea to make sure that there's food at the end of the night. After all that whiskey drinking, people need to refuel. Uh, they need to rehydrate. Having some pizza on hand is a great way to do that, along with making sure that you still have plenty of water. That's what we used. Everybody seemed to do just fine. Going along with that, obviously, make sure everyone is being safe and responsible. Don't let anyone drive home drunk. Make sure that they have a ride, they can get an Uber, they can, whatever they need to do. Make sure everyone stays safe.
So finally, we come to tip number 11. Roll with it. Not everything is going to go exactly the way you planned it. You might skip a topic in your presentation. You might uh, have people talking over you and they miss something that you said rather than going back and trying to f shout over everyone and force the facts down their throat. Just move on. You're going to miss things. Things won't always go your way. And you need to be able to take everything in stride. Improvise, adapt, overcome, and you'll have a successful whiskey tasting party. If you have any questions about hosting your own tasting party, or you have a tip that I didn't cover, please leave a comment. I'll be sure to check it out. Well, that's all the time we have for today on Dapper Drams. We'll see you next time.